I'm breaking tonight. You just heard from Senator Marco Rubio, just one of the GOP candidates speaking at the Heritage Action Forum in Greenville, South Carolina. Most of the GOP field took the stage one after the other tonight, with the exception of Donald Trump, as we reported earlier. Each of the candidates trying to build on Wednesday's debate and score points with a key group of conservative voters. Here's just a little of what we heard. I was a disruptor in Tallahassee, and I'll be a disruptor in Washington, D.C. We need a line-item veto power for the, for the government. They called me Vito Corleone when I was governor of Florida for good reason, because I vetoed 2,500 separate line items in the budget. If we're going to break the Washington cartel, the only way to do it is we've got to take it on and we've got to bring power out of Washington and back to the people. I don't buy this nonsense about all the Senate rules, 60, 60 votes out there. I got to tell you something. You know what? The Democrats don't play by those rules. They passed Obamacare with 51 votes. It's time we sent the president a bill that defunded Planned Parenthood with 51 votes in the United States Senate. The worst part is that the majority of Americans disagree with the tearing up of babies and the destroying of human life that this organization is engaged in. So why should their taxpayer money be used to fund that kind of activity? What happened to America? Joining us now, Charles Krauthammer, a Fox News contributor and author of Things That Matter, which is now out in paperback. Charles, great to see you. What a difference to hear the candidates long form, saying what they want to say and the messaging the way they want it, as opposed to on a debate stage where they, they're being pitted against one another with the goal of making them fight. Exactly. I mean, that is sort of Roman gladiatorial stuff that we saw in the CNN debate, where it was every question was set up as a fight between uh, two Republicans. And I do think this is a better way to get uh, at what these candidates are, it, because it does allow them to say what they have to say without having to get personal and without having to do ad hominems. And the other interesting part is when you set a debate up as uh, one Republican against another, you rarely hear about what the, the main argument in the election ought to be about the two parties contending, arguing their political philosophies. So you've had much less of a mention of Obama or Clinton in the debates than you do in a forum like this. You know, the, the Republicans have now spent the summer essentially uh, in inner Nissan warfare when they've allowed the Democrats to get away with uh, sort of being shunned almost or not mentioned as much as you would like in the, the run-up to a general election mm -hmm. campaign. And even in the wake of the debate now, you'd think their, their message would be solely focused on Hillary Clinton or I guess Bernie Sanders. But what we heard over the past day has been some of the candidates too trying to, it sounds like, you tell me, diminish what many believed was a win by Carly Fiorina. Listen here to Walker and Trump. I think going in, we knew the narrative, no matter what was gonna happen, was that um, they were going to say Carly had a big night no matter what, and, and obviously they said that. Wow. Uh, I don't totally disagree. I think they wanted to have some kind of a narrative. Uh, they fed her softballs. I, you know, I don't get that whole situation. Uh, they fed her softballs. So the, some of the things that she was asked were you know, ridiculous. Uh, Donald Trump said this, and uh, she practically didn't have to even answer. It's an interesting tactic. Your thoughts? Well, it's called sore loser. Uh, you don't do well. You, you say that the, the other guy, the other gal got easy questions. There were no easy questions here. And I think what really happened is we had one instance where Donald Trump was challenged and Carly did it. She did it in a very concise and cutting way. And for the first time, Trump had no answer. And that was an electric moment. And I can understand why uh, Trump would be upset about that. But it wasn't because she was a fed and easy question. And in fact, I think the other really great moment she had was when, in reference to no other candidate, she spoke about Iran and Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. in a remark, you know, on a, sort of an odd pair of topics in a single riff, which was riveting. Mm -hmm. And that was her other moment. And that was a positive moment. It was not about attacking other Republicans. 
So uh, she clearly was the winner. The idea that she was set up, everybody was ready to declare her the winner is nonsense. Mm -hmm. You watch the debate, it was a clear who shot. But I would add that Rubio, as I said on the night, uh, uh, right after the debate on Wednesday night, uh, he was a close second. What did you make of Rubio just now calling out Trump? I mean, some of the candidates have been asked about this today. Mike Huckabee, uh, Mike Huckabee said, I would have handled it differently. Didn't, didn't expressly uh, rip on Trump, but Rubio said ex explicitly, I do believe that Trump should have handled it differently. Is this going to be an ongoing thing? And how much damage, if any, did Trump do himself there? I'm not sure he did himself a lot of damage. I think the problem is that he's always ever since he got into the campaign, starting with what he said about Mexican-Americans and then what he said about John McCain, there's always the after story. There's always explaining what he really meant or he, he says he meant, uh, you know, what he said about Carly Fiorina's looks. Uh, so he's always sort of cleaning up after himself. That's a problem. Now, in fact, it hasn't hurt him. That's sort of remarkable. He defies the laws of political uh, physics. And in fact, his numbers have gone up. But I'm not sure how long that persists. I think the, the, the two dangers for him are that one, he gets boring. He's been very exciting, entertaining. You always want to see what's he going to say because you never know what's going to happen. But after a while, you have to come up with some substance and programs. The other danger is that he implodes or explodes. That hasn't happened because I think people are kind of attracted to a guy who says what he means and isn't afraid to say it and gets away with it. But there's a cumulative effect here where you're going to say to yourself, do you want to back a guy in a general election campaign who's going to have to be correcting himself every three days? That's you. It's hard to get your message out if that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Charles, always great to hear from you. My pleasure. Well, we also have a Kelly file investigation tonight into a group that staged a big so-called charity event to help vets, except this group is no longer a charity. So what happens to the million bucks? Plus, some of the presidential candidates are now weighing in on the growing debate over the teen arrested for showing up to school with a homemade alarm clock that some mistook for a possible bomb. I built the clock to impress my teacher, but when I showed it to her, she thought it was a threat to her. So, so it was really sad that she took a wrong impression of it and I got arrested for it later.